Hi there, and welcome back to the uh, next edition of Reese Lectures. Today we're going to be talking about post-war Asia, that is some of the nations in Asia that we haven't really touched on, and what's going on uh, in these areas after World War uh, II. By the end of this video, you need to be able to answer these following questions, and these are the four areas that we're going to be looking at, China, Japan, Iraq, and North Korea. By the end of this video, I want you to be able to go back and be able to answer these questions, because you never know, there may be a quiz. So, let's start with China. Remember that China became communist in 1949. And the first thing we're going to talk about is actually something that happens in 1950. In 1950, uh, the new co Chinese communist government invaded Tibet. Tibet is located just off the uh, southwest coast of, um, of China. And for years, Tibet had been a sovereign nation, that is, they were an independent nation. But when the communists come in, they claim that Tibet is not an independent country, but actually part of China. So they take this area over. Now the Tibetans, even though they're their own sovereign nation, they don't have a really strong army. And their army of about 5,000 people were unable to put up a resistance against the, uh, the Chinese army. Now some of you may know and others may not that Tibet is actually where the Dalai Lama is located. They have a whole sect of, um, of Buddhists and Buddhist monks that live in Tibet, one of them being the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama uh, was actually able to uh, flee over the mountains into uh, India uh, some years later. He w actually went on to win the Nobel Peace Prize in 1989 because of it. Since the Chinese took over Tibet, a number of things have happened, very few of which are good. Uh, the Chinese began to force the Tibetans to assimilate to mainstream Chinese culture. They moved... Um, their schools to be more Chinese. They set up um, their schools so that the, the Tibetan children would learn Chinese propaganda, Chinese language, Chinese culture. They destroyed the Buddhist monasteries. Basically, this was a cultural genocide um, on the part of the Chinese against the Tibetans. Many Tibetans don't even know their heritage because of the, um, the way the Chinese have uh, destroyed their culture. Uh, today, there are more Chinese living in Tibet than there are Tibetans. After the death of Mao Zedong came Deng Xiaoping. And Deng Xiaoping is in some ways similar to Lenin in that he changed the economy of China. And what he decided to do is keep the ideas of communism, but have a more capitalist economy, very similar to Lenin's new economic policy. Um, and he focused on four things. These were called the four modernizations. He wanted to modernize in four separate areas. He wanted to modernize agriculture. He wanted to increase the use of machines in farming. He wanted to allow for farmers to produce more than they needed. Remember, under communism, you produce what you need and then you redistribute it to everybody. He's saying, no, you can have access and with that access you can sell and make a profit. This is capitalism. Um, and that would encourage farmers to produce more so there would be no famine. He introduced something called the responsibility system where each farmer is responsible for making its own living, not everyone putting everything together communally. In industry, he wanted to emphasize light industry, consumer goods, where Mao Zedong was all about you know, steel, like those backyard furnaces, um, coal, those kinds of industries. He's turning more to consumer goods. Um, defense, this one's kind of obvious. He wanted to increase their um, technology in their army. And trade kind of goes along the same idea with um, industry and defense and agriculture. He wants to end isolation. He wants to open the door. Remember the open door policy? He set up special economic zones where foreign companies could receive benefits. And the um, aspect of the science comes in all of the new technologies and um, in agriculture and industry and defense. Basically, the same way that leaders did a sort of a policy of de-Stalinization, getting rid of what all the things that Stalin did. He does the same thing for Mao, so it's de-Maoization. So 
Deng Xiaoping is still communist, but he's easing government controls. He's welcoming foreign investment. He's encouraging capitalism. Another thing that he encourages is for students to study abroad. That is to go out beyond China and go to schools. And many Chinese began to come to the United States and other uh, Western democracies. And that eventually becomes a problem because <clears throat> what happens is these kids go out and they learn about democracy, something that they had never learned before. They had been under the rule of communist dictatorship. They had been brainwashed during the Cultural Revolution and now they're learning about these governments that allow freedoms and they want more of those freedoms. So when the students come back to China, what starts to happen is these pro-democratic movements. And the Tiananmen Square massacre that occurs in 1989 is a prime example of this. Um, students meet at Tiananmen Square and protest for more democratic um, values for the Chinese government. And they um, start to use the United States and other areas of the world as a sort of a, a model. In fact, one of the things that they do is they build this statue. It's called the Goddess of Democracy. And you'll notice that it looks very similar to the Statue of Liberty, which is what they were basing it on. And you'll notice the little picture of Mao in the background. Well, the Chinese government, they were not a big fan of this. And depending on who you talk to, you're going to get different accounts of what happened. Um, if you look at the pictures and first-hand accounts, what happened was basically the government sent in the military against these um, unarmed students. And I'm not talking like they sent in the infantry. They sent in tanks. And this is probably the most famous picture of the Tiananmen Square Massacre um, is this man who's standing in front of this line of tanks. And every time the tanks would move, he would move in front of them to try to stop them. But it didn't in the end. Um, hundreds were killed during the, um, the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Uh, and this is just one example of what happened when these tanks came through. Now, this is in 1989, which means that this is in a day and age where there are, you know, news cameras, newspapers, reporters that are around. And the Tiananmen Square Massacre is not something that could be hidden. Um, it had two major effects. One, it showed that even though that Deng Xiaoping was opening things up in China, he's still not going to be challenged. He was still willing to use violence and force to keep the people's will under check. But the other thing is, because of... Uh, the media coverage, like with Gandhi, now that there's media coverage, people outside of China are going to see this, and people were outraged. People start to question the treatment of the people in China and um, the areas that they control. That is, you know, is the Chinese government responsible for human rights violations? And you can actually see this today. One of the things that China is known for is sort of a play on words, the Great Firewall. Um, and the government, because it's a communist dictatorship, controls the internet and what kind of information is put out there. So if you were to Google the Tiananmen Square Massacre in the United States versus Googling it in uh, China, you're going to get very different results. And this is what you probably see. So on the left-hand side, Tiananmen Square protests, you'll notice that it's just a whole bunch of sort of stock photos of the Tiananmen Square itself. But if you were to do that in um, a Western democracy, this one's actually from the UK, you'll see the tanks and the bodies and um, the massacre itself. So even today, there is strict control over the people of China. In 1997, um, another major thing happened in China. Hong Kong was returned. Remember that Hong Kong was actually under the rule of Great Britain going back to the time of the Opium War and the uh, unequal treaties. As part of that treaty, Hong Kong was given to Great Britain. And the agreement was that it would eventually be returned to China. Under the development of Great Britain, because they're not under that communist dictatorship, their economy thrived. They became a huge um, center of industry and trade. 
But in 1997, on New Year's Eve, Hong Kong was returned to China, and many people in Hong Kong did not like the idea of this. Um, they were really concerned about how China was going to uh, react to this um, very capitalist society. Let's jump over to Japan. Now, again, going back to early 1900s, remember that uh, Japan was on a policy of imperialism. The only way that they were able to modernize under the Meiji Restoration was to go out and have to imperialize because they didn't have the natural resources needed to industrialize. Eventually, that leads them to get involved in the World Wars. And at the end of World War II, um, they lost. The bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki knocked out two major uh, cities in Japan. And following the signing of the treaty ending the war, the U.S. went in and occupied Japan for um, about six months, setting up a more democratic kind of, um, of government. And from that point on, Japan goes into an economic boom. It's actually called the Japanese economic miracle. Because of the bombings and the issues within Japan, they were forced to rebuild. And when they rebuilt in the 1960s, they rebuilt with the best technology. And so they were booming in the 1960s. But then in the 1970s, if you remember from your American history classes, there's an oil shock where um, the oil industry and OPEC starts to lower the amount of oil that's being put out there and the price of oil skyrockets. And because Japan doesn't have natural resources, one of the natural resources they don't have is oil. So this pushes them to look for new, more fuel efficient um, ways of doing business or even finding new forms of energy. This is when Japan starts to produce more fuel-efficient cars, the cars that we know today as being more fuel-efficient. Um, in the 1980s and 1990s, Japan has continued on this positive economic road. They have what they call a positive trade balance. And a trade balance is um, simply how much you export versus how much you import. And you want to export more than you import. That is, you want to take and sell more than you have to buy. And that, of course, makes you more money. And that's something that the, the Japanese have been very strict about, that their trade um, balance is positive. And because um, Japan makes it very difficult to sell products in their country because they have very strict rules and things like tariffs, so they promote Japanese-made products rather than foreign-made products. And now over to Iraq. Um, we're going to start with actually the Iran-Iraq war. And you've probably heard this guy before, Saddam Hussein, comes to power in uh, 1979. And you have to understand the sort of the history between Iraq and Iran. Um, the border between the two has never really made sense. It was simply, uh, it goes back to the time of the Ottomans and the Persians, where they kind of ran into each other during the 16th century. And that's where this like really vague line was drawn somewhere in the the mountains between Iraq and Iran. So the border between the two has always been kind of a, a hot button issue. And then in 1979, Saddam Hussein comes to power. And at the same time, uh, the Ayatollah Ruhollah Khomeini comes to power during the Iranian revolution. Now the two, while they are both Muslim countries, they are two different sects of Islam. In Iraq, they are the Sunni uh, branch of Islam, while in Iran, they are um, Shiites. And because of that, there's this um, fundamental clash between the two. Um, in 1980, Saddam Hussein's army crossed into Iran, and the two go to war. That means two of the world's leading oil producing producing nations are at war. And many of these countries actually sided with Iraq over Iran because people had an issue with this fundamentalist kind of fanatical theocracy that um, Khomeini had set up in Iran. Um, and it's sort of like choosing the less of two evils. Do you choose a corrupt, corrupt dictator or do you um, choose this sort of crazy um, religious fanatic? Finally, um, the UN negotiated a ceasefire, but that's not going to be the end of uh, issues in Iraq. In 1991, Saddam Hussein chooses to invade Kuwait. Kuwait is a very small nation, but it's also one of the leading oil producing areas of the world. And Hussein claimed that Kuwait belonged to Iraq. Of course, 
the nations that are using Kuwait as uh, an oil producer aren't going to allow that to happen. So the U.S. moves into Iraq. They were able to defeat Saddam Hussein and the Iraqis, but he was able to stay in power. Over the next decade, the UN and Western nations started to put sanctions on Iraq, um, that is, refusing to trade with Iraq. The only way that they would lift these sanctions is if the Iraqis agreed to dismantle their weapons program. And I uh, Saddam Hussein actually agreed to allow specters into Iraq and monitor their weapons program, but in 1998 he kicked them out when the sanctions still were not lifted. Fast forward just a couple years and 9-11 happens. And as you know about 9-11, it was an issue with Islamic fundamentalists. Not those in Iraq, per se, but it became sort of a larger global issue. Bush called it his war on terrorism, and Hussein called on all of these Islamic nations to oppose this war on terrorism. So the U.S. asked the U.N. to take action against the Iraqis because they were concerned that they had WMDs, that is, weapons of mass destruction. So in 2002, the U.N. sent in these inspectors, but couldn't find any weapons of mass destruction. Bush continued to push that they were making weapons of mass destruction and selling them. So the U.S., along with Great Britain, actually started to bomb military targets. This is when the Iraq War starts, is um, when the U.S. goes in and starts bombing these targets. And Bush puts them on what he called the axis of evil. Eventually, the Iraq War ends, and Saddam was actually hanged for crimes against humanity. And lastly, North Korea. So we need to sort of go back a little bit to 1948 to understand what's going on in North Korea. At that point in time, North Korea had become communist. This is prior to the Korean War. And their dictator was a guy by the name of Kim Il-sung. Now eventually we know, because we've already talked about it, in 1950 the Korean War starts. And the end of the Korean War is leaves North Korea and South Korea separated, with North Korea having continuing to have a communist dictatorship. By the 1980s and 90s, um, the U.S. the USSR is collapsing. Their you know communist neighbor is starting to fall apart, and that leaves North Korea isolated. By 1994, Kim Jong Il replaces his father, and over the next decade or more, he becomes very famous for the way that he runs the um, runs this country. By the late 1990s, one of their biggest issues is famine. Natural disasters have ruined their crops. Remember, these guys are communists, so people are living in communal farms. But the government refuses to admit to the problem, and millions of deaths occur. One of the reasons why the um, this famine really does occur is because when the government refuses, it's because the government is focused on other things. And one of the things that they're focusing on are uh, nuclear weapons. A study done um, of 204 refugees that gave information on over a thousand family members said that of the 204 refugees, 245 family members or 25% had died within the last two years. And the starvation was the cause of the death in 63% of those cases. In 2005, the government cut their food rations to 50% of what the World Food Program says that you need to be able to survive. Basically, what they're given is the equivalent of two small bowls of rice or five potatoes per day. And when you think about what you have to eat versus what they have to eat, it is barely enough to survive, which is why you see so many people dying of uh, starvation in North Korea. Today, and you've probably seen these on the news because it's constantly in the news, um, is their nuclear weapons program. By the early 1990s, they've refused to let these UN inspectors come in and um, look at their, their nuclear facilities. Um, and by 2002, they've outrightly admitted that they have a secret weapons program, and that goes against the agreement that um, the members of the UN had made about who can and cannot have nuclear weapons. Um, so that caused... Um, President George W. Bush to put North Korea on the axis of evil along with Iran and, um, and Iraq. In October of 2006, North Korea tested its first nuclear weapons. 
And this has caused some people to put sanctions on North Korea. And because South Korea has become such a well-known and successful um, industrial center, this is becoming even more of a problem. And since then, Kim Jong-il um, has died and his son has taken over. And he is continually pushing for the use of nuclear weapons. To give you an idea just as to the difference between North Korea and South Korea, this is a picture of North Korea and South Korea. It's a satellite image at night. The white spots are um, lights. So you can see the major cities of North, or excuse me, South Korea. But you'll notice that in North Korea, it is dark. Even their capital is dark during this time. Just to sort of give you an idea as to the differences that you're going to see between North and South Korea. So that's it for today. Go back and take a look at those questions. Make sure that you are able to answer them. If you can't, you may want to look through things again. Thank you.